you guys ready? Let's do this. Yeah. Ready, I said, first of all, I'll say it again, just so everybody knows, uh, Sharon lives for this moment. Shh. So uh, she was never more sure we should have planted Grace City Church than this morning. So just so you know, she's really excited to be here. Yes, yes. Are you <laughs> thankful that Sharon is joining us yeah. today? <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. I might have liked her answers as much or more first service, bro. I'm just going to be... I, I'm, I'm not arguing it, with you. <laughs> it, it was good. All right, here we go. So first question this morning, you asked for, how do I deal with a consistent prayer request that goes unanswered? Hmm. Um, well, you jump in when you want, babe. Um, I, I would... Uh, I've got to take these stupid things off. Um, I guess I would... I would, I would gently and pastorally push back on the premise of the question. And I would say that there's never been a prayer uttered that went unanswered. So God hears and he responds. And sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, sometimes it's not now. Um, but, but what we do know is that we're never, we're, we're never praying to God and he's not listening we're never speaking to God and he's not answering. He's always answering. He's always responding. He's near. He's present. He loves us. And like a good dad, um, he's responding to us. Now, it might not be what we like or what we wanted. I, I went to my parents a lot as a kid and didn't get the answer I wanted. But that didn't mean I didn't get an answer. And so um, his silence is in his distance. Um, he is hearing, responding, and he is answering. And there will be a day we see now dimly. Um, but Paul says there will be a day when we'll see, we'll see fully because of the brightness of the presence of Jesus. And in that moment, we'll will see and will understand that God held all of it together, including us and the things that we were talking to him about. And we may not understand on this side, but there will be a day when we will understand why he answered every prayer how he did. So that's how I feel about that. And in the interim, don't get stuck there. Like don't just get stuck sitting and waiting for him to answer just this one thing. Hmm. You got to keep moving forward with the truth and what you know to be true. So don't get hung up on one thing, even if it is a big thing. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay, let's move on to number two here. How do I deal with not having the desire to read God's word? Um, I don't know. You wanna... Yeah, I've, I've definitely had some pretty serious seasons of this. Um, and personally, um, just feeling like a, time in the Word was pretty dry, and there wasn't a lot of desire to read it. Um, and I think for me personally, there was a lot of prayer, encouragement, support that helped walk through that, but also a new understanding that it's God's voice to me, and it's Him speaking to me. Um, and so for me personally to understand that that was how He was going to communicate with me in all things. Um, and obviously through his spirit, he does that as well. But his word was a gift to me as a believer. Um, yeah. I would say, I would, I would connect it to the question before. It's like, why isn't he answering me? Maybe he has answered you. Mm. And, we, and, and, and he answered, he's, he's spoken clearly in his word. And there we hear the, vo the voice of God plainly. So when we're in the word of God regularly, we're, I think we're more attuned to hear his voice. And I would, just, I would steal this from you. You told a bunch of high school kids one time, they were like, I don't want to read the Bible. And you say, what if I paid you a thousand bucks every time you read your Bible? Would you read your Bible? And they were like, yeah. <laughs> so you would if you thought it was worth it. That's right. You would if you thought it was valuable enough. And you know, the word of God refers to itself as treasure beyond what you could wildly imagine. So, so we value intuitively a check for a thousand dollars every time we read it. If we did it every day, that'd be $365,000 at the end of this year if you read your Bible. There is treasure beyond the value of that in the reading and meditating upon the word of God. So just think about that. It's, it's like if someone offered to pay me a thousand bucks, yeah, I'd probably do it. What am I believing to be true in this moment? That money and earthly treasure is more valuable than the riches God has to offer in his word. That's a lie. I reject it. I'm in the word. So you can think that way too, maybe. Good. Okay. How do I deal with struggling not to use profanity at work? <laughs> You want to answer that one? <laughs> yeah. I yeah. deal with that all the time. I wouldn't even say it's a struggle. I just let it go. <laughs> um, oh, that was helpful. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. We're not recording this one, are we? Scratch that one. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> struggling, yeah, struggling using preventing or not using? I mean, which is the... Right, right, right. Well, I mean, obviously there are things, you know, James 1, 2, somewhere in there, you know, the, the tongue, you know, you know, taming the tongue. So the tongue needs to be tamed. The tongue is a, is a spark that can start a fire, um, that can destroy lots of folks. So words matter. Our, 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 the, our heart matters. We know words overflow of what's in our heart. Um, this is going to be controversial, so I don't know if I should say this or not, but... but I'll, I'll talk after you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. And like this will get misconstrued. But like sometimes you have to. Now, this is why it's controversial. And, and, and Adam's like, <laughs> what? Yeah. Or, am I going to have to fire you on Monday? Next I'm like, uh, well, Pastor Josh, I'm going to go to... No. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, here, and, and this is why people will excuse themselves. That's not the point. But, but when I was, I was in construction, and when I was in construction, the, just a constant, just verbal spewing of sewer water over your soul was almost more than I can bear. It was just constant. And I just had to ask the Lord, God, protect me, God, help me. I mean, because they're, they're taking the conversations places you would never go you're on your own, and it's conjuring up images and pictures and, 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 and subject matter that's just sick and disgusting and gross and ungodly and unholy and, and unhelpful. And so, so that, that's a real issue. But, but um, I was in law enforcement, did reserves for, for six years, and, and I remember down on Wenatchee Avenue between the one way or above the about the avenue on the one way, so was pursuing a subject, a uh, suspect, I should say, and uh, come around the corner, and he was, he was a suspected gang member. I come around the corner, my buddy went the other way, and, and there's five of his buddies, all suspected gang members, and, and, and staying there, and in your train, it's like a gang member is almost always armed. It's part of their code, and so I'm in an alley with five potential suspected gang members, potentially all armed, and me, by my, this little skinny white guy, right? <laughs> I'm like, and, and what I wasn't like, Hey guys, gosh, would you please, you know, put your hands behind your back? I was, uh, and, and words came out of my mouth that I had never spoken before. They came, and I'm like, it was like verbal jujitsu. You know what I mean? It's like there's, there's one, there's, there's only a few words here these guys are going to respond to, and I'm using all of them. And so it was like to hear this little skinny white homeschool boy cuss was probably really funny. But I was like, in that moment, I didn't have guilt about it. I, I was like trying to stay alive. And, and like there was one, there was one way they were going to understand me to talk. And so I've talked with Christian law enforcement officers. They're like, gosh, like sometimes whatever, and they struggle with it. And I would just say, the Lord knows your heart. Pursue righteousness, you know. And in a moment, if it's if it's going to save your life, then I don't know. This is terrible. <laughs> you... My turn. <laughs> so what I hear you saying is it's okay. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I don't know. I don't hear Would you, you saying. Help that. clean this up here. Are we over our time? Can we go to the next question here? Yeah, we're. Sharon, did you want, did you? I was just going to say, I was going to say that I think that um, profanity, I I think this is very difficult. And I think there are habits that are put in your mind and heart from years of practice. And that's hard to break. But I would say, as with any habit that was pre-Jesus, as you grow and mature in Christ, there is a change of your desires and your heart and your mind and your speech and your countenance. And so I... There you go. That was a much better go. answer. So. <laughs> I noticed Adam like, that's good. Yes, that's good. Yeah, come, I'm on, gonna, please, come on, please. sister. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, preach, more, preach. more of Sharon, less of Josh. Yes. So I'm just going to say, I think that, um, yes, this would be very hard, but I think that, and sometimes it's going to take time as with habits and old things that have been a part of your lifestyle. But I think that there's not a thing that Jesus's power can't break. And so profanity being one of them. There you go. There you go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Take her answer. So <laughs> on the habit issue, which I think is probably where that's coming from, James 3, Ephesians 4, those are a couple passages that speak to let your speech be seasoned with grace and taming the tongue, self-control, fruit of the spirit, all that stuff. And there are situations for those in lines of work where it's life-saving. Okay, there's... Unless you're in an alley, apparently. There's, we can okay. nuance it. Yeah, unless you're in an alley surrounded by gang members, yeah. then well, yeah, there I mean, you go. All right, we'll move on here. Next question. How do I deal with America's politics, social, and economic collapse? This, this, the question was the future potential coming collapse as we contemplate taking on a significant building project. And there was a version of this question, first service, that is in here again. So here you go. Um, well, I, how, how I answer, answered this, the version of this in first service was um, uh, we don't know the future. And God hasn't called us to do a posture of fear. Romans 8 says he hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of sonship that cries out of the Father, meaning we, we don't, we're not afraid of the future because we, we're intimately related to the one who holds the future. 
Um, and so uh, God has called the church to hope in the promise of his coming return and stay busy till he gets back. And if the posture of the church is we're going to wait until you know, the White House settles down or the economy uh, you know, uh, uh, levels off or, or geopolitics simmer down and then we'll advance, it's like, well, then you're going to sit on your hands the rest of your life. If anybody should be confident and hopeful of the future and advancing the, the, the agenda of their cause, it should be the church. And so when I read this question, I, I don't hear wisdom in it, I hear fear in it. And that's not, we're not a people of fear, we're a people of hope because we know who holds the future. So we're moving forward. Yep. That's good. Yep. Yeah, and I would just say that if we're not moving forward and moving into it to provide the hope that people need, when, then when everything falls apart, where are they gonna go? So if there is socioeconomic collapse and, and our economy is destroyed, we should be the ones that have what people need. And that is the only thing, that's Jesus. Yeah. So. Working to be in a place of strength to serve those when everything else falls apart. Yeah. Yeah. That's good, good. Okay, let's, we'll keep rolling here. So how do I deal with educating my children? Homeschool, private school, or public school? <laughs> well, there's only there's one clear answer on the board. Obviously. Yeah. Um, I'll let Sharon speak to this as well, but I'll go ahead. Or do you want me? No, go ahead. Go ahead. You have something. Well, I blew the last couple, so. Um, I'm after you. Okay, yeah. You clean up. Yeah. So I, I would say um, a couple of principles to, <clears throat> to stand on is that you as a parent are 100% responsible for the education of your children, no matter what option you choose. Um, and there are inherent challenges in all three options on the board. And if you think there's a silver bullet better than the other, then the, you're asleep at the wheel. Um, every, every option, whether it be homeschool, in private school, or public school, will present its own set of unique challenges that you need to be prepared to face. And so the answer, I think, is pick your problems. And some parents decide to pick problems that come with public school. Some parents decide to pick problems that come with homeschooling, and there are, there are many. Some uh, families decide to pick problems that come with private school, and there are many. Um, I don't care which set of problems you pick, just understand the set of problems you're facing, consider the frame of your child, and then make a commitment to stay engaged in the process and shepherd them through the process as the one primarily responsible for their education, not the school system and, and, and not the teachers. And then don't think that you've picked the road of least resistance because then you're asleep at the wheel and you're going to get bit. There are some parents who should never homeschool. The last thing they should do is homeschool. They would be hurting their kids if they did. They're not equipped for it. They don't have the capacity for it. They don't have the time for it, whatever it may be. And so don't look down on these other means of grace to educate your children and don't unplug thinking that one will be the silver bullet providing the answers and you, and you don't have to be involved. So pick your set of problems and be involved through the whole process and ask God for help because you're going to need it. Yep, I agree. Our, we do one year at a time, one kid at a time. Each of our kids may be completely different too. So I think the frame of each of your children um, is, is a, a little personal thing. They are their own little person and deciding what they can and can't handle when and, and where. So that's another piece that we implement a lot is every year we evaluate with our kids. Good job. Okay. How do I deal with death? Hmm. Uh, you come to our Life After Death series. <laughs> yeah. well, we got to be quick. Boom. Shameless plug. Starts next week, three services, 8 o'clock, 940, 1120. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <clears throat> three easy payments of 1995. <clears throat> uh, do you want to save it to next week? Move no, on? Keep we're going to talk about it for nine weeks. We're going to talk about it. Come back next week. There you go. Oh, That's good. Absolutely. We will talk about it. Here we go. How much, how do I deal with, how much do I really need to tithe? 10% or more? So this more. question about more. Okay. <laughs> I think there was... It, Next. It actually said someone put 28%. So Absolutely. 10% or 28%. So like, are those God. the options? <laughs> I don't... I didn't. Totally. Um, uh, how much are we... Well, uh, just the language here, tithe is 10%, right? And so the, the question is kind of confusing. How much should I tithe? How much 10% should I give? Well, 10, you know, so the, the word tithe means 10%. We believe the Bible teaches that followers of Jesus are to give the first fruits of what he's given to them back to him to, as, a, as an act of faith and trust and acknowledging that he's the giver of all good things and he's the owner of all things and it reminds us physically and tangibly that we're stewards, not owners. And so uh, I think the Bible's injunctions are clear. We're to give back of the first fruits. And uh, the 28% the, the probably came from the Old Testament where, you know, it, it, it's, if you look at it, um, 
God set laws in place where between the tithe and the offerings and caring for the Levitical tribe, you know, it was about 20, 30% because they, they were sustaining, you know, um, a different kind of form of government in, in terms of a, of a, theopoly, a theopoly. So, so, um, so I wouldn't think those restrictions aren't in place in the New Testament, but what is clear, I think the tithe, I think you could make an argument that the tithe is still in place for, for believers and, and that it's a good place to start. So we often say the tithe is in the ceiling, it's a starting place. Right? It's not the roof, it's the launching pad. And, um, and I would just encourage you, if you're not, to begin. And I realize different people, different parts of their journey and trust and faith in God. I have never met, I'll put it this way, I have never met a growing, thriving, flourishing, effective, joy-filled follower of Jesus Christ who's not, who's not employing the, the principle of, of the tithe. If you don't get money right, nothing else works. And so whatever excuses you're making to not get on board with this, they're not worth it. Um, and so I just put God to, to the test. You know, make whatever cuts you got to make and get on board. You know, Sharon and I made a, a, a commitment that we wouldn't ever drop below 10%. You know, it's not a law. It's really that, you know, we're giving in response to God's grace. And so by God's grace, over the years, we've been able to bump it, you know, 11, 12, 13, sometimes 14, 15%, some back down to 12%. It's not a legalistic thing. We're just like, we're always looking for ways to answer the question, how much can we give? Not how little can we give? And so I think it's a posture of your heart. And just for the record, if every family tied at Grace Street Church, it'd be game over. We'd be, we'd be kicking tail and taking names. So I recognize that people would have been parts of their journey and that's okay. But get on the train, that's a good train. You, you'll never talk to an old believer who's, who's, who's lived according to this principle who regretted it. Not once. You, you, you'll, you'll buy and spend lots of things and money that you regret. Never once will you regret giving to the work of the kingdom of God. If you value true investment dividends, you will, you will invest as heavily as possible in the kingdom. And so I think, I think 10% is a great place to start. And, and, and then ask God to help, help, help you move on from there as, as a foundation for a lifetime of generosity. No, no laws, no, no guilt, no shame in response to God's grace. Sorry. Good. Okay, next one. This is, a, this is a tough one. This is a tough one, giving you a heads up on this. How do I deal with life? This is from an eight-year-old. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, if that eight-year-old is here, yes. what, what would you say? Oh, four words. Listen to your mom. <laughs> and enjoy it, because it's downhill from here. <laughs> oh, I probably shouldn't say that to him. Nice. Yeah. All right, here we go. We'll keep rolling here. How do I deal with lost confidence in the church? And we, can't, we had sev- you know, several types of questions like this come in regarding you know, I've been hurt in the past, mm-hmm. you know, previous church experiences, leaders, et cetera. So how would you answer someone who's there going, man, I've, I think I've lost confidence in the church. Mm-hmm. What do I do? How do I deal with that? You can speak to that. Or... Yeah. Um, I have a little personal experience with this. I grew up the daughter of a pastor and um, went through a very difficult um, time. My parents were extremely hurt and it was very challenging for me. I was a teenager um, and a lot of hurt and pain that kind of pulled us away from, I would, when I say the church, I'm, I'm meaning like the gathered body like this. Um, it really was hurtful to them. And so they didn't want to have anything to do with the gathering of the believers anymore. Um, that would have been a really easy place for me to veer off into bitterness and frustration. And I think the Lord was really gracious to bring people around me that helped me realize that, um, you probably are going to lose some confidence in the church because it's made up of humans. It's made up of people that are flawed. Um, But the grace of the Lord was that I didn't lose confidence in him. And he has called us to gather as the church, flaws and all. And so um, one of the best things I think that happened to me even during that season was the ability to come back and gather with believers. It wasn't with those same people and I pray that they are walking with Jesus and are flourishing but the Lord allowed me to plug into a new body of believers where there was health and growth and pain and, and hurting people too. But um, I would say that you're going to be around people that are going to disappoint you. That is just the way life is, and the church is full of us. Um, but you don't lose confidence in Christ. Yeah. Yeah, I would just add to that, what did you expect, right? Yeah. I, I, I mean, lower your expectations and look to Jesus. I mean, I'm, and, and, and I don't, I don't, I don't I want to be gentle here because there's some people who have been genuinely hurt. I've been hurt. Hey, we've all been hurt. I've had terrible things done to me, said to me. We've, gone, we've walked through experiences. Like, I'm a pastor, so I know better than anybody the underbelly of the church. 
It's, it's there, it's reality. And if I was like, oh, the church, you know, we're not victims here. Jesus is amazing. He hasn't lost confidence in the church. Why should I? You know, he loves the church. It's his bride. It, it, he's coming back for her. And so like, I want to, I want to look to him, put my hope in him and then love and serve the church as long as he's called me to be a part of it and, and to do my part to work for the health of it. Because when you, when you say, oh, that church is so sick, well, if you were a part of it, <laughs> right? So, uh, so like work for the unity of the faith and work for the unity of the church and pray and labor and love and, and forgive and long suffer and, and cover over a multitude of sins with love and, and work for the unity of the body because they will know us by our love for one another. If you're if in this jaded position with the church, you know, I, 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 my heart would be concerned for you because Jesus isn't jaded. He loves the church. And so don't despise the things he loves. Okay, I'm watching our time here. We're going to do some rapid fire. Okay, We're going okay. to try and speed right. it up here uh, to get as many of these in as we can. So how do I deal with being a single parent, raising children, and getting support from the church? I know it's a big question, but 30 seconds, 45 <laughs> seconds, what, what's, okay. well, we first, can get to some others. First of all, if you're a single parent, like my, our hat's off to you. Mm-hmm. You're doing the work of two human beings, which is extraordinary. Um, so we love you. We're 40. We support you. Um, you may not have arrived at your situation by your choice, I'm guessing, and so that you're taking responsibility for your kids is a noble thing that God is for and he's behind you and he loves you. And I would say plug in a community. Uh, don't, don't, don't back off. Don't, don't, don't um, um, disengage. Engage. Ask questions. Ask for help. Get involved in a community. Uh, you have a new family and a better family than the one that's abandoned you, and that's your church family. So get in a gospel community and live in community and allow the church to be the church and love and, su- and support and help you. We want to do that, but we can't if you don't ask. So... Mm-hmm. That's good. Okay, let's keep rolling here. How do I deal with millennial Christian leaders? Carl Lentz, Rich Wilkerson, etc. Are they legit or false teachers? Uh, I have no idea. Uh, I don't know them personally. So th- th- this, this is a little bit of a pet peeve for me, so I'll try to respond in a godly pastor way. <laughs> but, but, but like, you don't know them either. So how can you know? Well, I write your books. Yeah, I, I, I get that. But, but we're so quick in this internet age to live, to like dub ourselves as like the watch, you know, the watchdog of Christianity. And it's like, eh, I think that's a lame wall to stand on. Um, Paul says to watch your own life and doctrine closely. And, and I think that's a much better use of your time. And so, you know, these guys, I, I've heard of Carl Lenz. I don't know Rich Wilkerson. Um, you know, my guess is if we got together and talked, he'd probably be a really cool guy I would enjoy. And we might disagree on some things, agree on others, but like, I just, it's not on my radar. If he moved to my town and started preaching clear false heresy that was hurting our, our city and hurting our church family that we're called a shepherd, I, I, would, I would pursue a relationship with him and, and engage at that point. But, but to be quite honest, um, keeping watch of my life and doctrine absorbs a large portion of my, t- my time. And so that's where I want to keep my eyes on my focus. And I got a lot of stuff in my own life that, that are not up to snuff, let alone worrying about where somebody else is failing, so... Good. Yep. Okay. Yep. We're going to, we'll get a couple more in here. Uh, how do I deal with a church with only men in leadership? Um, honey? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so uh, we're going quick, so I, I, I don't mean to sound abrupt or uh, uh, unpastoral, but the two angles, if, I, if, I, if that question was asked antagonistically, I, re, I would reject the premise. There are women in leadership everywhere here. Brittany and Kaylee are leading men and women in overseeing Grace Kids. We have, we have uh, wives leading gospel communities with their husbands. We have women, single women leading gospel communities full of men and women doing an incredible job. So, so you know, Susan leads our A-team of 20 uh, volunteers that oversee the administration thing. So I think everywhere throughout the organization, if you'd like to say, or the family, uh, I look and I see competent, this is, this is almost as offensive to me, competent, godly, women of capacity, l- using their gifts, leading, loving, serving. Now, if this was an honest question, you know, in terms of like, well, how come I don't see them on, 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 the, on the stage as much? My answer would be, well, we have convictions, um, biblical convictions that God has called elders to, to lead and govern the church, and that's a role that God's appointed to men. And so uh, our theology tells us, our complementarianism tells us that, that, that there are distinction between the genders um, in the roles that God's given them, but there's no distinction in value. So distinct in function and equal in value. And so um, we believe that God has called the church to be led by, by male elders, um, and that's the sing- singular office, which is very small, 
um, that he restricts to men. Every, 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 everywhere else is open for both men and women to serve and use their God-given calling, gifts, and capacities to serve the church. And, and I will say that, that different Christians uh, come to different places on this. I have good, dear friends who, 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 uh, who uh, don't read certain verses in the Bible. No, I'm kidding. Who, uh, who, who don't come to this position, and that's totally fine. And, and they have women as elders in their church and preach in their church, and, and I got no problem with that. It's an open-handed issue. This is our conviction. It's an intramural conversation, and, and, and that's how we, we believe we're being faithful to the Word of God in that way. And I will add on top of this, and I know we're late on time, but like we do have a heart for men because we do believe as men go, the cultures go. When men get it right, things go well. When men get it wrong, things go really bad. Historically, you don't see a lot of women dictators killing millions of people, right? I mean, there is a leadership thing in the world that's true that when men lead well, th- people flourish, and when men fail to lead, people, people uh, a flounder. And so we, we unapologetically have a heart to call men, punch them in the face, man up, step up, carry on fire, wouldn't follow Jesus, and respond to the call of God to lead in every sphere of life he's given you. Because quite frankly, women are awesome. They're there, they're ready to go. It's the men who oftentimes drop the ball, so. Yep. Well, we're, we're a couple minutes over time. I think we gotta wrap up, but I, uh, I'm gonna ask Sharon if you would, you would um, pray for us as we close our time. Thank you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time this morning, and Lord, we're so thankful that not a question that we have or a concern we have or a fear that we have is beyond you. Lord, we're so thankful that you have the answers, that you are sovereign, that um, there's not a thing that surprises you. And for that, we are so thankful because it's in you that we can put our hope and our trust and our faith. I pray that uh, you would be with these people this morning and any questions or concerns they have. Lord, may you, by your Holy Spirit and through your word and through your people, uh, minister to them and help them this morning, Jesus. We just thank you again for the opportunity to gather as your church and worship you this morning in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's thank these guys again for doing their best, did a good job answering these questions.